Listeners, readers, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Foxed page where we dive deep into the very best books. We end up with a much richer understanding of the title at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, editor, and PhD in literature. And for anyone out there who doesn't actually traffic in rare books, Foxed Page might be something of a mystery, but foxing are simply those little tiny brownish dots that you see on the pages of very old, beloved books. Today, I cannot wait to dive into Cassandra at the Wedding by Dorothy Baker. So as always, this first installment, this first half hour chunk, there will not be any spoilers. We're going to talk a bit about why I think you should spend your time reading this book, We'll talk a little bit about Dorothy Baker's uh, really interesting and unconventional biography, and then we'll dive into the prose. In the second and third installments, as always, we'll just dig deeper and really get a, a, a even more rich and, and sort of more uh, deep understanding of why this novel is exceptional. So let's get started. I'd like to begin with a sort of incantation, a kind of affirmation that actually comes from Dorothy Baker herself. She has articulated something for me, and I hope for the rest of you all, which is one of the gifts of literature, the way that it can articulate things that we didn't quite know needed articulation. This one has to do with why I love to read, and also maybe will clarify at least a little bit for you why it is that you also like to read. In this passage, which we will find in the book, Cassandra at the Wedding, she is talking about the sister, Judith, as a pianist and Judith's realization that she will not, in fact, maybe go on to be a concert pianist, not a professional pianist, but this idea of what it is about music that feeds her. And as always, if you come across an artist, any kind of artist, visual artist, musical artist, in a piece of fiction, it's always good uh, to note that that might, in fact, be a stand-in for uh, the author herself. Here's Baker. It had more to do with belonging to a tradition and staying in it and working at it in any capacity you can fit into, playing what's being written and what's been written, trying to keep it alive and separate the chaff from the grain and keep them separate, know which is which and care, and that's a life's work. What I love about this book is that the chaff and the wheat here, the, the, the grain is unbelievably rewarding, but it also is a book that I found so charming and so funny and so irreverent that in lots of ways it feels kind of chaffy. So I'm looking forward to digging into why there is so much pathos and so much emotion and so much incredible prose here, but also why it, why it is so incredibly appealing um, and, and accessible and interesting in ways that feel very fresh and very original. Okay, so we're gonna begin, in fact, I've already begun, talking about why we should read this book. Well, this one, let me tell you, Cassandra at the Wedding is kind of a writer's dream, and in lots of ways that translates into a reader's dream. So what I mean by that is that there is incredible humor and there's incredible pathos, but in addition to those things, which are some of my favorite ingredients, there are also some really deep philosophical questions that Baker is asking. Um, some of these questions have to do with identity, they have to do with family, with mortality, with sexuality, with becoming an adult, with loyalty, with pessimism versus optimism, with marriage. Really, a lot of the sort of big, heady questions are being brought to light in ways that I found unbelievably engaging and rewarding. There's a lot of nostalgia for the mid-century California that I didn't quite grow up in. I was born in 1969, um, and this book came out in 1962. But there is a sense of, of a California that I know and love, uh, mostly being the Central Valley, which I haven't spent um, a ton of time in, certainly driven through it many a time. But there is a deep, um, a deep nostalgia here for a California that I love. Also, there is just this unbelievable prose. We're going to pick that apart a little more. There's this amazing attention to detail. There's a there's a use of symbolism in this book that, I mean, it honestly should be heavy handed and yet none of it feels heavy handed. But we're going to just go through some biographical information and then dive in. Dorothy Baker was born in Missoula, Montana in 1907, but she was raised in California. 
She herself was a violinist and was deeply, deeply invested in music, but had polio when she was a young-ish girl and so had to give up her musical career and, and shifted to a love of literature. She went to a couple of different colleges, Occidental and Whittier, and then graduated uh, from UCLA and went on to get a French master's also at UCLA, so studied French both as an undergraduate and a graduate. She moved to Paris where she met her husband, Harold Baker, and wrote a bunch of short stories and, and right away embarked on a literary career. Her book, Young Man with a Horn, which was published in 1938, was incredibly successful. Um, it was about jazz and it was a way for her to sort of sublimate this passion that she had for, uh, for musical art into literature. In that book, we see a woman whose sexuality is somewhat ambiguous, and this is something we'll see again and again in Baker to different degrees. And um, this sort of preoccupation with lesbianism and, and this idea of, of what it means to be attracted to a woman if you are a woman. She did confide her lesbian sort of leanings or her desires with close friends, uh, to, I mean, two close friends, she confided this, but she did stay married to her husband. and. From the facts, as I read them on Wikipedia during my uh, literary sleuthing, uh, it seems like she had a decent amount of support from Harold. She wrote, in the sense that, I'll explain, she wrote a book called Trio, which was very much about a, 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 a lesbian woman and her relationship and sort of her the way that she was vying uh, for a younger woman uh, with a man. And she and her husband together made Trio into a play that got all the way to Broadway. It was actually shut down as soon as it made it to Broadway because of um, obscenity in the form of this lesbian preoccupation. But by all accounts, Harold was supportive of, of this book Trio, which had everything to do with kind of overt exploration of what it is to be homosexual. The couple uh, then moved to California. They had two daughters, Ellen and Joan, and they lived in a ranch um, called Terra Bella, California, where, uh, where Dorothy continued to write also while she was running a citrus ranch that all seems very reminiscent of what we will find in Cassandra at the wedding. So I wanna go ahead and dive in to take a very close look at what it is that makes this book so unbelievable. So those of you who are here, either listening or watching, um, those of you who are interested in sort of making yourselves better readers, the thing that I would say is most important, and it's, it's actually very simple, is simply to pay attention. So I find myself often um, skipping over things. I do also read for several hours every day. Uh, I also have a terrible memory. But paying attention is something that you can do, um, you know, sort of intermittently. But whenever you are paying attention, that's when you're going to get the most out of your reading experience. So we always begin with the title. So in this case, Cassandra at the Wedding is very, very significant. All titles of any good prose should be significant. This one is particularly so. So in this case, Cassandra, you may recognize the name from Greek mythology. She was a woman who was living in the Trojan era and the curse that had been put on her was that she always spoke the truth. She could see the truth and she could speak the truth, but she was never believed. So in this case, she knew that the Trojan horse was a Trojan horse, not she knew that it was full of, of, of the enemy but nobody seemed to believe her. So right from the start, we have this sense of Cassandra as having this really storied past. This is someone who comes with a lot of um, sort of baggage attached. And this is an important point. If you did not know that about Cassandra, if you didn't know that she sort of faded to never be believed, it doesn't matter. I don't think that it, it will greatly, you know, sort of depreciate your enjoyment of the novel, but this is the kind of subtle, subtle or not so subtle detail that Dorothy Baker is including, which I think is is um, part of what makes this book such a kind of uh, a writerly gem in lots of ways. So first of all, we have Cassandra, who is fated to tell the truth but not be believed, and we have Cassandra at the wedding. So it's not Cassandra at her wedding, it's Cassandra at the wedding. We're not really sure whose wedding it is yet. There's a destabilization that's happening right from the start that's helping us understand that Cassandra herself is, is this wedding is the central element and Cassandra is in lots of ways the central character. 
but we're sort of adrift otherwise. We don't know, it's not Cassandra at her sister's wedding. Um, so, so we have this sense of, of, of having an anticipation, but, but being a little bit unmoored. The other important thing to remember is in classical literature, meaning, you know, from Shakespeare on forward, a comedy is something that ends with a wedding. So it's sort of if something is going to be happy and positive, then that piece of literature or that play or that um, television show, that rom-com, that movie is going to end with a wedding. This is getting to be a more and more outdated trope. But that's certainly, you know, in the middle of last century, in the late 50s, early 60s, even though Dorothy uh, Baker was, I, want, I keep wanting to say Dorothy Parker, and it's actually a very apt, um, about uh, Dorothy Parker being a, a sort of cynical, kind of crusty, by all accounts, terribly alcoholic woman from um, sort of the Faulkner era, you know, the, the, the earlier 20th century. I think there's a similarity there just in terms of wit and in terms of, of, of sort of um, self-assurance that both of the Dorothys share. But in this case, Dorothy Baker, um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Uh, but in this case, Dorothy Baker is using this wedding as something to sort of play against. So we're going to find out whether or not the wedding comes off, whether or not there actually is a wedding. And that is a question that is that is central to the sort of unfolding of the plot. So we have this title that really is doing a lot of work. It seems very straightforward, and yet it is not, in fact, um, straightforward by any means. We're going to move forward through the book here. We get to this dedication. So this it's in memoriam for David Park. David Park was, um, he and his wife were close friends of the Bakers. He was a painter and a jazz musician. And in fact, I love this, this, this girl sort of leaning over this fence here. This is an image that was done by David Park. And um, the other book that, that uh, Baker is really well known for, uh, uh, A Boy with a Horn, is also um, the, the illustration on the front, Young Man, sorry, Young Man with the Horn, is also a David Park illustration. So. This is important in that Dorothy Baker was someone whose entire life revolved around music and art and beauty and literature. So it's very fitting that she has uh, this dedication to this gentleman. It also, this close friend, but it also is significant to me, this idea of in memoriam, right? It, it, she could have just, you know, it could have just been for David Park. But this idea of in memoriam is interesting because it's lending a little shadow, a little pall has been sort of um, cast over this dedication because it is about death. Right from the beginning, we have this idea of a wedding and it's going to be a rom com -y kind of happy thing. And then right away, uh, you know, it's subtle, but nonetheless, we have this, this reminder of death right at the beginning. Then we have a, um, it's not exactly a chapter heading, but it's this, uh, this page that says Cassandra Speaks. So I am one, I would not actually gloss over this because it's the only thing on the page, but I am notorious for sort of skipping right over chapter headings. I don't know why I do it. I think I'm so eager to get into the prose, but I like the fact that this is on a page all by itself because it forces us, in fact, to focus. So on this page, it says Cassandra Speaks. Of course, what's important there is that Cassandra, as we know, is given to pronouncements, she's given to prophecy, and all of her prophecies come true, but we know that she's not going to be believed. So there's this, this curse that she has that weighs heavily on her and may or may not go badly for everyone else. The interesting thing, and we also don't know this, it's not part one, Cassandra Speaks. So again, I think that Dorothy Baker, as with all amazing writers, is trusting the reader to, to just kind of go with the flow here. What we don't know yet is that on page 137, we're going to have a, a, a section that's, you know, it's well into the middle of the book here, a section that's called Judith Speaks. So in the Old Testament, Judith was a widow who was, she was this incredibly beautiful widow and she killed an Assyrian leader, an Assyrian general, in order to um, safeguard all of the people in Israel. So you have these two giant figures, one from mythology with Cassandra and then the other from the Old Testament, these, these two women who have these huge legacies and these very sort of powerful positions. And what we're seeing in these sections is that each of them is going to speak. So these young, in this case, they're young women, these women are going to speak. And that's a very important thing. We're gonna talk about voice in the second um, session. 
of, of this exploration. But in this case, um, it's, it's important just to recognize that we're going to be hearing the voice of Cassandra. It's not her father speaking. It's not an omniscient narrator. We're really getting um, a first person account and the voice of a young woman from the middle of last century, which is significant. What we also don't know is that on page 193, Cassandra will speak again. There's another page that looks exactly like this one that says Cassandra speaks. So Cassandra is going to have the last word. We can be fairly clear from the start because her name is in the title of the book that she is the central character, but it is significant here that she is also given the last word. We're finally ready to dive into the actual text itself. The first thing that you'll notice here, well, maybe not the very first thing, the first thing that you'll notice is that I told them I could be free by the 21st and that I'd come home by the 22nd. So this idea of I told them I could be free is so significant. This seems like, um, you know, it sounds like we're, we're hearing about her kind of her diary, not her diary, uh, diary in the British sense, you know, we're, it's like we're hearing about her calendar. We're hearing about the logistics of this thing. But this idea of, um, of like simple logistics is a really good indicator. It's a very good introduction for the fact that lots of what's happening in this kind of brief and, and in lots of ways funny novel by Dorothy Baker, it seems like it's kind of logistical details or sort of unimportant you know, happenings that are occurring when in fact every single thing is working incredibly hard, every single word, every single image. So in this case, I told them. So there is again the sense of her, of her language and of her voice and of her ability to communicate but there's right from the start, literally in the first three words of the novel, we have I, them. We have this kind of this, this uh, adversarial thing set up. It's sort of I against them. And of course, what's interesting, well, lots of things are interesting about that, but what we're talking about here is an identical twin. We don't know that yet, but all of this kind of I versus them is part of this process of individuation that these two young women, these two identical twins are kind of in the throes of. So I'm also totally fascinated, I think everyone is to a certain extent, by individual, I mean by identical twins. It's kind of a, a, like a massive Freudian slip that I just said individual twins, because the work of what is happening in this book is the work of individuation. It's the work of young women coming into their own lives, becoming adults, moving from you know, undergraduate college days into their own mature lives. But it's so it's an experience that all of us have, but all of the kind of traps and pitfalls and all of the difficulties of this are, are put under this microscope and they're heightened because of the fact that these are these are identical twins. So this idea of becoming your own person, of course, is is magnified when you have someone who is not only identical to you physically, uh, I mean, not exactly identical, but close enough to be mistaken, uh, but, but also someone who has spent really her whole life fighting this idea of being kind of one person and being isolated, but also, you know, having a clear understanding that, you know, the way that, for example, her parents won't, her mother in particular is adamant about not dressing them alike, there is this sense of, of, of needing individuality and being very, very different people. So that, that struggle that everyone faces of how do I move away from my family and what kind of an adult am I going to be and who, who am I in this world, all of that is magnified by this, by this identical twin situation. So it's also so interesting here that we say, she says, I told them I could be free. I mean, it's just, it's so significant. And what she means, of course, is like, I will be available, but there is, it's not a mistake. She doesn't say, you know, I told them I could be available. It's that I told them I could be free. Then we go into this whole thing of lots of numbers. So we have the 21st, we have the 22nd, we have June, and, and the 21st and 22nd, if you see numbers like this, it's important to take a little step back and think, why am I being fed all these numbers? And in this case, my, my best guess, although there are lots of different interpretations, is that she said she's going to be available on the 21st 
uh, I'm sorry, on the 20, um, that she would come home the 22nd. There's this gap between when she says she's going to be available and when she said she's going to be home. So if you if you look at going home and this homecoming as, as kind of a um, reversion back to childhood, she's putting it off. There's sort of this, she's going to be free for this one day period between sort of college, although she's, it, you get, I guess it's her senior thesis, maybe. No, no, sorry, she's doing, a, I think, an extra year of graduate work because Judith was off at Juilliard. But you have this sense of her as kind of wanting this freedom and then going back early because of this idea of homecoming and wanting to be home and wanting to be back with her sister. But 21 and 22, I think, also have significance um, soon. In fact, just in the same paragraph, she talks about how before they were 21, they figured out how to have, um, you know, which bars they could stop at on their way home, driving, different era. Uh, they found, you know, different ways to, to pretend like they were 21 when they were less than 20 or when they were under 21. So there's this sense of them growing up and then this idea of becoming 22. So presumably they're 21-ish they're now. I actually can't remember if we know their exact ages. But you have this sense of them being sort of right in this zone of 21 or 22, their ages. So there's this importance of this gap here. Also June being in parentheses. I, I love a good parentheses when it's well done. In this case, this idea of June, you know, spring and early summer being about you know, sort of growth and the beginnings of growth. We're not talking about the harvest season in August. We're talking about um, the beginning of the summer, which is, you know, a time of, of, of great sort of fecundity and, and, and growth and fertility. Here we are at the end of, of the second sentence here. But everything went better than I expected. I had all the examinations corrected and graded and returned to the office by 10 the morning of the 21st. And I went back to the apartment feeling so footloose, so restless that I started having second thoughts. So one thing here, um, this is a fancy literary term, which is in media res. So it's just a Latin term meaning that we are jumping into something in the middle of it. It's something that's already going on. I love in media res because it's, it's usually, a, 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 there are lots of sort of tricky things that incredible prose writers can do to immerse you in something right away and make you feel like you're caught up in the middle of something that's happening, which is a very intimate thing. This is not sort of, you know, once upon a time and there's not a lot of scene setting. It's like we're right in there talking about this young woman's, you know, schedule and when she's going to be home. Um, but there is this sense of, of trusting us to understand. And she does such a good job of that. You know, we understand that this is some sort of a graduate student professor who's grading papers and who's getting them back to the university. So we, we know a lot about this young woman, even though very little kind of naming has gone on. But I also love she was feeling so footloose, which is generally a positive thing, but then right away it becomes so restless. So there's this idea of feeling footloose and fancy free and sort of, you know, again, free, and then feeling restless, which is obviously very different, that I started having some second thoughts. Now, this book is all about second thoughts on the part of you know, every single person in this book is having lots of second thoughts about lots of different things. Maybe not the grandmother, but everyone else, although probably also the grandmother. But this idea of second thoughts as sort of finishing that first chunk of text, it's still the same paragraph, but it's, it, we're ending with this big sort of weight on this idea of second thoughts. And what she's having second thoughts about is, is staying the one night. So there's this kind of second thoughts about being free, the second thoughts about having, you know, time to herself in the apartment in Berkeley. She goes on to say, it's only a five hour drive from the university to the ranch if you move along. If you don't stop for orange juice every 50 miles the way we used to, Judith and I, our first two years in college, or at bars, the way we did later, after we'd study how to pass for over 21 at under 20. So again, here you have those echoing of that echoing of those important numbers. You also have this, again, this kind of trusting thing when she says the university and the ranch, at this point, unless I had told you, you wouldn't even know that you're in California, but ranch is something that's, you know, you can have a ranch anywhere in the West, certainly, but the university, she's starting to sort of plant these more uh, specific details. What's very important here too, though, is all of a sudden we have this first person plural, this we, what we used to. So there's this sense of her just using we and, and trusting the reader to, to sort of just 
relax. And, you know, she's going to tell you who we is in just a minute. But then right away, we the way we used to, Judith and I, our first two years. So there's this sense of we as, as being, you know, most importantly, herself and her sister, not the wider family. It's not the people of California. It's not the graduate students. We, in this case, is always Judith and I. As I say, if you move, if you push a little, you can get to Berkeley to our ranch in five hours. So now that things are getting a little bit more specific, it's Berkeley is the university and our ranch. So suddenly, we're, geographically, we're situated, we're also situated in you know Northern California, you know, and, and this young woman during the 1950s is at university. So we're getting more and more information about what's happening here. The reason we never cared to in the old days, meaning the reason they didn't speed along, was that we had to work up to home life by degrees, steal ourselves somewhat for the three-part welcome we were in for from our grandmother and our mother and our father, who loved us fiercely in three different ways. So right from the start, it's notable that we have this matriarchy set up. We have this grandmother, and then we have the father who's not related to the grandmother, and then we have the mother. So we have this grandmother, mother, and then this set of identical twins. There are lots, a lot of sort of girl power. It turns out, of course, that the, the father, this you know retired, uh, young retired uh, philo ph philosophy professor, is in fact very, very important, but he's so much a tragic figure. I mean, this is someone who is an alcoholic, who is living on this ranch, who is just thinking of philosophical problems largely by himself with his mother-in-law, which is so sad because it speaks to the grief that everyone is still feeling over the loss, which we haven't actually gotten to yet. Sorry, I jumped ahead a bit. And it's so nice because right from the start, we're, we're reassured that everybody here loves each other. And you, you have a sense, I think, um, just because of the straightforward way the narration is going, that we're not being lied to here. So when she says, we were in the, the welcome, we were in for from our grandmother and our mother and our father who loved us fiercely in three different ways. That's very powerful. Fiercely, of course, is a, is a um, you know, it's a fierce, ferocious kind of word. And three different ways, it's so, these girls are very lucky to be loved ferociously, uh, fiercely, by three different people in three different ways. So there's no shortage of love at this point. She goes on to say, we love them too, six different ways, which is so sweet. There's this kind of multiplication and all of these numbers, maybe it's kind of a strength in numbers kind of thing. But in this first paragraph, this emphasis on numbers and, and, and sort of proliferation is really beautiful. We loved them too six different ways, but we mostly took our time about getting home. So again, um, one of the things that I would counsel you to do if you're trying to read more richly and more deeply is to understand that the word or the phrase or the image that ends a sentence or that ends a paragraph is incredibly important. Partially because it's, um, you know, the, the sentence, everything in the sentence is building toward this thing at the end, but also because it's a term, even at the end of a sentence, and it's only the span, you know, of a, of a period of a space between sentences, um, it, it is something that's lingering in your mind. So in this case, getting home is a, it's a very, very important end to the beginning of this, of this pretty dense, pretty long first paragraph. So usually we would stop right then, but I do want to look at this very next um, sentence. It wasn't three part anymore, the welcome. I am a huge fan of the M dash. So that, that kind of double hyphen, that M dash there is really important. It adds an enormous amount of emphasis. So you have this beautiful, it, it wasn't three part anymore, which is ominous. And then the welcome. Our mother died three years ago, much too young, but I'm not sure she thought so and she would therefore not be present at Judith's wedding. It's so sad. You have this kind of beautiful um, idea of homecoming and you have some ambivalence and some second thoughts and whatnot, but, but then we're hit by this kind of bomb, this idea of the mother as having died recently. And, and it's so complicated because we also are given to, to think that this was a woman who was complicated because she maybe didn't think she had died too young despite the fact that she has these young girls. But, but there is this idea of, of the, the gigantic loss in the wake of this mother having died. 
And then it's tied so beautifully and so directly with the idea of Judith's wedding. So the loss of the mother and Judith's wedding, which are imparted at the beginning of that next, um, of the second paragraph of the book, kind of come as this one-two punch that's really so beautiful and, and just really speaks to all of the pathos in this book. Welcome everyone to the second session of our discussion of Dorothy Baker's unbelievably great Cassandra at the Wedding. In the first session, we talked about why um, you should devote all of these hours to reading this incredible book. We then discussed Dorothy Baker's biography briefly, and then we dove in to the first uh, couple of paragraphs, the first paragraph and a bit of the novel, just to get a real sense of why this prose is so exceptional. And also um, to do that exercise that I encourage you all to do, where you take a close look at the very first paragraph in order to understand how best to proceed and where to focus your attention. In the second session, we are going to be talking about the voice of the narrator. In this case, it's a first person narration. Um, that, that is held by two different people, which is always an interesting approach and, and one that I think works incredibly well here. And then we're going to discuss the structure of the novel. In this case, it, it actually sort of jibes very nicely with the voice in the novel. And as we talk about the structure, we're going to take a very close look at a couple of important scenes. So whenever we um, are together, I, you'll, you'll know that I have this real emphasis on voice. And when I say voice, there are a couple of things I mean. One is simply the voice in which the story is being told. So is the narrator choosing the first person, uh, usually I, sometimes we, but mostly I, the first person singular, I did this, I did that, or usually it is a third person. So, you know, Cassandra did this, Judith did that, Granny did this, um, Papa did that. So in this case, we have a first person narration. And I always like to point out the importance of women, uh, of, of not only women writers, but, but, but women characters in novels having voices. It's very important and, and sort of an important political act in some ways to tell the stories of women, something I think we're all um, very aware of these days. In this case, we have this very interesting first person because it's not just Cassandra who is speaking, it's also her twin sister, Judith. As you can imagine, their voices are similar in lots of ways. They've grown up together and very isolated in this kind of rarefied philosophy professor father and um, novelist and playwright mother. So they've grown up in this kind of heady uh, environment. So their voices are similar, um, but there's some real differences we're going to take a look at. What I like too about the voices is that we have Cassandra speaks and we talked a little in the first uh, session about the importance of Cassandra's voice, given that she, um, she, is, she you know, says prophecies, uh, most notably on the wall of Troy, and yet no one believes her. So we have Cassandra who's speaking and then Judith has a brief time speaking and then Cassandra is speaking again. One of the important things too to recognize is that if, if the important work of this novel is individuation, if what we're kind of invested in here is the idea of these two young women becoming separate adults and going their own way toward, toward womanhood, toward adulthood, it is important that we hear from both of them. It's obviously mostly Cassandra's story. We hear more from her perspective by, by a good margin, but it's also important to hear Judith in part for the contrast, but also because it does really help us see the ways in which they are very different people. Okay, so let's begin on pages six and seven. We're gonna take a look at Cassandra's voice here. And these are, whenever I'm choosing, um, you know, things like this to take a look at, uh, uh, when I'm choosing a passage to take a look at something like voice, we're obviously also taking a very close look at all of the other elements that make this such an incredible novel. On page six, it's the first full paragraph, the second one on the page. I pulled the page out of the typewriter, crumpled it up, and dropped it into the waste basket beside the desk shuffled the other six, 56 pages until the edges lay smoothly together, put them into a folder and then into the top drawer and snapped the cover onto the typewriter. If the apartment should catch fire while I was at the wedding, the world would never know what it was I was at such pains to stay, say about the novel as currently practiced in France by mere girls and some boys. But it wouldn't catch fire. 
and when I got back, I would undoubtedly pull the crumpled page out of the waste basket, uncrumple it, copy it word for word, and be back in business. Two weeks from now, maybe only a week. So one thing to remember here is, again, this idea of prophecy. So Cassandra is telling us right here, you know, on the third page of the of the novel that she is going to return to work. So on some level, if, if you're an astute reader and you know the story of Cassandra, you should be taking this, you know, you should be taking this as prophecy right from the start of the book. It's also important. She's got this kind of self-deprecating humor throughout, uh, you know, and she's very doubtful. She says that it's very difficult to follow in the footsteps of her mother. Jane, uh, but there, but there is a sense of, of of this desire that she has to be a writer and to say things about writing. You'll remember that um, that uh, Dorothy Baker was a scholar of French literature, and Dorothy Baker, you know, had confessed her her lesbian leanings, her her homosexual urges to friends of hers. So there is a lot to be read into um, the, the the sort of uh, melding of Cassandra with Dorothy Baker, the autobiographical piece of this. So there's this notion of, you know, she knows that the apartment's not going to catch fire, but there's also that kind of self-deprecating thing about um, how it's the it's the French the French novel as practiced by mere girls. But there also is an important thing uh, there about she's amplifying the voices of these French girls. Okay, and then right across um, on page seven, this is more to take a look at, at, at her voice. And there's a certain sort of scattered air about Cassandra. There's a certain urgency. There's lots of pathos and lots of humor. But I loved this because there is this is doing so much work, this passage right here at the top of page seven. I'm very fond of my grandmother. We both are. And I picked up a box of chocolate cherries for her before I left town. They were out in the trunk of the car, melting, while I sat here in the cold bar getting solidified and hoping that I had not put the chocolates on top of the box with the dress in it. Dress I'd picked up before I left town and charged to one of my grandmother's accounts as she frequently implored me to do. It was a white dress and it would probably do for the wedding. So we have a lot happening here. We have these cherries, which is symbolic, I think, of, um, of virginity and of growth and of secrets being hidden inside something else. We have the, this alcoholism, this kind of incipient alcoholism that, that becomes a larger and larger issue over the course of these few days when they are all at home, this one sort of week of the wedding. But we and we have this kind of everything is always on the verge of getting very messy with Cassandra. She can't find things and she's, um, you know, misplacing things and she's breaking things and she's has things that are in the trunk of the car that probably shouldn't be in the trunk of the car. And they happen to be also on top of her white dress. Of course, this white dress for the wedding is going to take on much more symbolism as we move forward. But you can even see in kind of the grammatical setup here with these M dashes and these fragments and these repetitions the box with the dress in it, dress I'd picked up before I left town. So there, there's this kind of scattered feeling that we have about Cassandra. So we're going to take a look now at the voice of Judith on page 142. She also has kind of a scattered sense, which makes sense because both of these are young women under a great deal of stress at this point in their lives. But also, um, you know, these are very, very close sisters in many ways who are in the process of individuating uh, and becoming adults. So down at the bottom of 142, this is when um, Judith is with her fiancé. I didn't want to cry, not in the coffee shop or anywhere else. I turned my hands over so that I could do a little holding. You might say clinging. And after a little of it, I felt safe again. At least I knew I wouldn't cry. So there's, there's a, you can hear a little bit of a difference there. The, the sentences being spoken by Judith are a little shorter and they tend to be, there's a little more colloquialisms. There's lots of like, you might say clinging. It's kind of a little bit more conversational in some ways. Let's look at the next page on 146. This is another section of when she is speaking. Um, she's here with her fiance and they're about to get married for the first time. On 146, we're kind of down in the middle, lower middle of the page. He turned and looked at me and then pulled me over beside him. And I came in close like all the high school girls we used to turn up, turn our noses up at. We were wrong. It's the only way to sit in a car. It gives you some confidence. You can confide. 
So again, we have these more staccato, declarative, shorter sentences that Judith is speaking. There's also, though, a sense of sort of groundedness and security in her when she says things like, we were wrong, or it's the only way to sit in a car, you can confide. These are um, declarative sentences that speak to her self-possession, something that Cassandra does not yet have. Now we're going to move on to page 150. The other thing that we see in Judith's voice is a little more reportage. So Cassandra is talking a lot about what's happening around her, but there's more editorializing and there's more worrying and there's more kind of obsessive thoughts. With, with Judith, we see a little bit more straightforward, you know, description of what's happening. It's still incredibly significant what she's saying, but it's a bit more straightforward. The bottom of 150. I watched him walk down the hall and turn a corner. And I pushed the door open and went inside and realized that I was within five minutes of becoming a different person, facing in a different direction, free to be myself for the one I loved. So again, you have this very, there's a, there's a real sense of security, even on the eve of something that, that is life changing. She's very clear about what's happening around her. And this is so significant because if you'll recall um, earlier in the novel when um, when Cassandra is, is hiding in her grandmother's bathroom because Judith is off on the phone with Jack, Cassandra then pretends to wash her face. Or she does wash her face, but she it's, it's in order to give a reason why she's hiding in the bathroom. But here, right before Judith is about to get married, we have this scene. I washed my face three times with soap from a dispenser, dried off on paper towels, combed my hair, tucked in my blouse, decided against lipstick, and when there was nothing more to do and my watch still said I had one minute, I stood where I was and I looked in the mirror, steadily and for as long as I had, and made my farewells to the one I saw there. Goodbye, Cassie, let me go now, and be happy, because I'm going to be, and you can too, I'm sure you can. So much is happening here. When she is foregoing the lipstick, on some level, I think that is her foregoing um, the makeup of the clown. So this clown image that their, their mother found for them and put in their room and that is watching over Cassandra during her suicide attempt, that the, the, the lipstick for me is, is both about sort of, um, you know, not being yourself or, or exaggerating yourself. She can entirely be herself with her fiance, even at this huge moment. Um, when lots of women were op would opt for lipstick. But there is also kind of a shadow of, of the clown who is really a stand-in for their mother. There's also this looking in the mirror. There are lots of mirrors in the book. Mostly it's Cassandra looking into mirrors, whether at the bar or looking into the mirror of the water like Narcissus. But in this case, we have Judith looking in the mirror at her sister's face, essentially, and really being very clear about their futures, that, that she knows she is going to be happy and she knows Cassandra can too. So we have this, this very sort of distinct voice on the part of Judith that's really very beautiful. But what's interesting, and this is a perfect segue into the structure of the novel, what's interesting is even in the section um, when we have Judith speaking, Judith's story of the wedding is really only 13 pages long. Then as soon as they arrive back at the ranch, it's still Judith's voice, but it's very much Cassandra's story. To take a quick step back about the structure, we have in the beginning, Cassandra speaks, we have her homecoming, we have this, this sort of crisis, you know, is the wedding going to happen? Does everyone want the wedding to happen? Obviously, Cassandra does not. The question of sort of, are the twins gonna be together and go off to Paris and be, you know, as they have been the whole time, which is Cassandra's fantasy, doesn't ever really seem like reality, or is the wedding going to happen? Then we have Judith leaving. You know, Cassandra at one point, it looks like she might try to impersonate her sister and go to Bakersfield and tell Jack that the wedding is off. But it is Judith who says, no, I will not let you do that. I, am, I will not let you pick him up. Judith leaves and we have this suicide attempt. So then in the second part, which we're gonna look at in just a second, in the, this part where Judith speaks, we actually have her wedding. So within those, those 13 pages, which is very brief, she doesn't get a whole lot of airtime here, something very significant happens. She decides, in fact, that, that she's going to take this very bold step with lots of conviction, and they, in fact, get married. You'll recall that um, a, a wedding signals 
you know, um, happiness and it, it sort of happy resolution and, and all good things coming forward. You know, back in the day, uh, you know, think Shakespeare or think even the, the, the Greek um, tragedies and, and comedies. If something ends with a marriage, that's a comedy. And it means that, you know, it, it's a very positive kind of lighter thing versus a tragedy. So we have a wedding that's already happening in the middle of the book. And of course, we have the second wedding um, that comes later. I want to take a look at the suicide attempt. So on page 135, this idea of, of, of Cassandra wanting to kill herself is something that has been, you know, she stops eating and she's drinking too much and she's sort of following in the footsteps of her father, the reclusive alcoholic, ex, you know, philosophy guy, more than her mother, who is this accomplished writer. So this, this sort of suicide attempt ends up being kind of this dark night of the soul. It's this very kind of um, cathartic thing that happens with her. And it's very important the way that Vera Mercer is involved. But I also thought it was important to go back and take a look at the suicide attempt because it's, it's, it's maybe frustrating because it's more of a cry for help than a real suicide attempt. Although I always think that's a good thing, obviously. So if we take a look um, at 135 here, She's talking about the different um, bottles of pills. The next was the last. It still said as needed for sleep, but since it didn't make any adjustments for shorter or longer sleep, I had to stop and think what it would take to do it without overdoing it. So what I took away, I mean, I think you could argue that in fact she is trying very hard to, to kill herself, but when she's talking about sleep, shorter and longer sleep, my, my strong conviction here is that she's talking about wanting, I mean, it's a very selfish thing on some level, wanting to show her sister that she's not going to be able to tolerate this and sort of scare Judith into maybe not marrying Jack. But there is this sense of, of um, you know, she's really obviously in crisis and having a very hard time, but it seems like what she's after is sleep and scaring people more than she actually wants to die. Uh, and then a little further down, um, when she, in kind of the middle of the page, uh, she's deciding seven or 11. And it, I didn't mention this before in the 56 pages of the thesis, the 57th page, all of these numbers, I don't know what that one means, but all of these numbers, you have to um, assume that there's significance, seven and 11 being kind of standard lucky numbers, and also them, they're, they're not being uh, 13. So she had taken the two, so she takes 11, then it would be 13 total. So there, she's playing with numbers certainly here, but this is important. She, she said, I think I stayed with seven or 11 which would get us to 13. Then I emptied the rest of them into the inside pocket of my bag, along with the other two bottles, put the bag under Judith's bed and took the empty bottle to the nightstand beside my bed. So on some level, she's wanting everyone to think that she has taken the entire bottle when in fact she's taken 11. And of course, 11 is not a small number. I mean, Nebutal, which I'm not, it's a tranquilizer from, you know, the middle of the last century. And obviously she's doing some real damage to herself. But it was important for me to go back and take a look at what her intentions are there, in part because the way that the book is structured. So we have um, the ensuing 35 pages of, um, of you know, Judith's section, and it is in fact told from Judith's voice. The ensuing 35 pages are all about Cassandra um, being saved by Jack, which is, it's such an unbelievably great passage. There's that moving part where Judith is so shaken because she comes in and sees Jack giving mouth to mouth resuscitation to her sister. And it's a very confusing image. There's so many really great commentaries about sexuality throughout this book, which actually is a good segue into my next section. So in the last part about Cassandra, a lot of what we have in that, so you have first Cassandra, then Judith speaks, and then Cassandra speaks again. And a lot of what that last section, it's, it's brief, a lot of that has to do with Vera Mercer. And I wanna take a slightly closer look um, at, at the uh, relationship that Cassandra has with Vera Mercer. So this is her psychoanalyst. Um, it does seem to be, you know, this is like good old fashioned analysis with the, the psychiatrist and the, the person on the, on the bench. But there, there is, I mean, on the couch, there's a lot more happening. So when, when, um, so we have a little bit of backstory as we go along. We know, in fact, that Vera Mercer has seen Cassandra's house. We know that Cassandra twice has been to Vera Mercer's house. But let's take a look at page 200 to get a slightly better sense 
Um, and again, I think we can look at this under the guise of structure because it's this whole last chunk is sort of a, she's moving away from her family. She's able to individuate in part because you, this is kind of a substitute mother figure, Vera Mercer is, but she's also a substitute lover in lots of ways. So this really is a, it's, it's a process of individuation, um, just as we have uh, Judith marrying Jack and, and sort of exiting the family and going to New York and having their apartment together. As, as much as that is Judith's way to depart from the family, this is Cassandra's way, you know, largely with the help of Vera Mercer. Mercer, by the way, Vera um, is, it, all of the names are so significant. Vera, in this case, having a lot to do with veritas, with truth, and Mercer um, is having to do with mercy and, and, and sort of having mercy on someone. Also to mercerize something, I think, is to make it stronger. So there's that sense of um, like a sewing kind of a technique um, with, with fabric. Okay, but so let's take a look at page um, 200. I liked this. This seemed like an important thing to me on 200. I kept thinking, please don't let Vera really be seducing this young woman because actually in Dorothy uh, Baker's novel Trio, the, the older woman who was gay was actually fairly predatory and that caused a lot of problems in terms of the reception. In this case, we do not have a predatory older woman who is gay, who is trying to seduce the younger woman. And here's some proof on page 200 here. This is Cassandra speaking. I'd stormed her house twice. Once she'd shown me the door and once she'd let me stay nicely under sedation in a room at the other end of the continent from hers. So there is a sense of Vera as really, um, you know, keeping some boundaries intact, certainly. And then if we look at 201, just kind of right across here. So she asks Vera about how strange it was, whether or not it was strange to meet her twin sister, which is a very important um, juncture for Cassandra. She says, Cassandra is reporting what Vera said. She said it was startling how much we look alike, astonishing at first glance. And then importantly, so that was reported by Cassandra. And then we have the actual, with the quotation marks, we have Vera uh, Mercer's actual voice here. But after that, I couldn't feel you have anything at all in common. It ends right there. No, I've told you, it's still the same. Take her away and I'm half of whatever we are. There was another wait. I heard her draw breath, and then she said, no, I was wrong. She's a nice girl, but you're Cassandra Edwards, and there's only one. I love that. So there's this real affirmation, and, and of course, Cassandra goes on to, to sort of fight against this concept, but, but there is this sense of, of, of someone who really, really knows and who is really invested in Cassandra, who is recognizing the fact that these, that these young women are, in fact, individuals. Okay, and then we're going to look lastly at pages 202 and 203. So this to me is the key in lots of ways of um, how to read the end of the book, but also sort of the, the, the like heart of the book really in some ways is here. So on the bottom of 202 here, this is Vera. Everybody has impulses, she said. I have all kinds, just about like yours. So there's an affirmation here of, of some sort of, presumably of, of some sort of passion and some sort of sexual longing. But I always hoped I could bring you to understand that there is such a thing as a whole life, a way of life, and a reason for being that is strong enough to protect you from every little whistling call of the wild. Such a beautiful, beautiful piece of prose there. But it's also so important. So, if, you know, her work was really to shore Cassandra up and to convince her there were many reasons to live. What reason for being? That's what Cassandra says. She waited so long that I thought I'd stumped her, which is so funny. There's so much, there's so much, so much humor in this book and it's so elevated and subtle and, and wonderful. Then she said, work mostly. So let me read that again. Cassandra says, what reason for being? She waited so long that I thought I'd stumped her. Then she said, work mostly. Work and interest and love. So if you recall the fact that early on in the novel, we see this work that she is doing with her thesis and she talks about her thesis again and again, there's lots of, it's, it's very present in lots of ways. And um, when she puts it away and she says, you know, I'll be back in two weeks, if not one week, and I'm going to get back to work. 
So we have Vera here in this case really emphasizing that, you know, maybe what was going to bring Judith into adulthood and make her so, so happy was to be with Jack. But really, uh, for, for Vera herself, and as far as she can tell for Cassandra, what will matter most is work. Work and interest and love. It's such an amazing, uh, such an amazing statement. So, and it's one that, that when we discuss the, the close of the novel, it will be a really great way uh, to think about the end of the novel as well. Readers, welcome back to part three of our discussion of Dorothy Baker's amazing Cassandra at the Wedding. Let's dive right back in. So one of the very best uses of figurative language in Cassandra at the Wedding is the use of symbolism. We've talked before about how figurative language is simply any language that is used to mean something that isn't quite what is exactly denoted by the language. So metaphor, simile, um, a motif, personification, any one of those things falls under this category of figurative language. But symbolism is sometimes can be very heavy handed and often is um, is sort of feels like a cheap trick. But with Dorothy Baker, it's some of the very, very best symbolism I've ever seen. And the book is absolutely just chock full of the most incredible uses of symbolism. One of the main ones that I want to walk through today is the idea of water. So water is something that that figures really, really prominently. We're gonna look first right here at page 22, one of the first instances of water that we see. This is when uh, Cassandra has left Berkeley and she is arriving, she's driving through the Central Valley. This is farmland and it's also drought stricken farmland for the most part. So water is very important here. So on the top of page 22, it wasn't far to seek just across the road a plank pump house with a pipe sticking out of it, spilling a clear head of water into a high cement weir. And I got out of the car and went straight to it and looked up at it, water, without which nothing for us farmers and also for us vagrants. So there's this nice thing, um, Dorothy Baker herself and her husband Howard ran a citrus farm, which is exactly what um, these people are doing. There's a lot of discussion at one point about orange juice and grapefruit. So, so this is, it's, it's very autobiographical in this sense, but water um, is not only obviously important to the farmers, but it's sort of the lifeblood. It's what allows people to live uh, at all well in the Central Valley in California. Then we have another symbol right here. There was a sunbeat ladder leaning up against the weir, and I went up four or five rungs very gingerly on one that was split around the nail until I was high enough to touch the flow with a finger and then with a whole hand. So we have this idea of ascending, this idea of climbing up the steps of a ladder. What's impressive to me is one of the rungs is split. So you can imagine it being split by a nail in that it's coming apart. So you have this idea here, it's so skilled and it's like, this tiny symbol within the symbol of the ladder, within the symbol of the pump house, um, and the weir is like a like kind of like an aqueduct, like a, a you know a, a way to get the water where it needs to go. But in this case, this split rung on the ladder, this idea of progression, the split rung can be read as Cassandra and Judith, and this idea of them coming apart. So then we have this incredible baptismal scene a little further down. I went up and leaned far in. My mouth went to pieces with such a push against it, but I made it hold while I drank. I made it hold again and again, and then without even deciding to, I stuck my head in and let the water tear through the roots of my hair and sluice one ear. I didn't stay long, and on the way down, I forgot all about the rung that was split. It was very dusty where I landed, and I'm not sure, but I think I cried a little. This is the most incredible passage. So one of the things, she's leaning far in, she's taking a risk, she's up at the top of the ladder and her mouth goes to pieces. So there's this incredible preoccupation in this novel with language and with communication. So this idea of her mouth going to pieces, first of all, it's sort of her, her sense of, you know, falling to pieces herself, but this idea of the locus of communication is falling apart. She's unable to communicate but she makes it hold, you know, she makes it hold again and again. 
Um, and then she sticks her entire head in. And again, this is this baptismal thing so that we have the water that's pouring over her. It's pulling at her hair. And the sluicing of the ear, notably only the one ear, is I think I think it's this idea of, of both having your, your hearing obstructed, but also having it cleared out. So there's a sense of her as going through this baptismal process, this kind of um, washing clean that will allow her to accept whatever it is that her sister has to tell her. And when she said, I didn't stay long and on the way down, I forgot all about the rung that was split. So she has forgotten both, well, I mean, I think you can read into this that she has forgotten about this process, this kind of, you know, this splitting apart of the two of them. And then there's this incredibly deft thing where Dorothy Baker elides the fall. So she doesn't, she doesn't tell us about, you know, I fell. And because it's, it's almost like it's too much for her to describe. It's too much for her to be able, um, you know, to sort of fit into this passage that's about renewal and baptism. And, and so she, there is no fall. There's no description of the fall. All we have is, I forgot all about the rung that was split. It was very dusty where I landed. And I'm not sure, but I think I cried a little. So again, we have more water with these tears. Um, yep, more water. But this idea of, of eliding the fall, of cutting out the fall, whenever something like that, when you make a jump, it's important to take a look and see what it is that the author is skipping over because generally that's going to be something that's very significant. Uh, we're going to jump to page 32. We're going to read a quick bit on page 32. So this is when she first arrives at the ranch and she's realizing she's going out and, and it's dark, it's nighttime, but the water's glowing. I could see that the underwater light was on and the water was churned up. So there's, it, there's stress, there's turmoil here. I saw the flash of an arm or it may have been a leg and then a lower tie stopped it. These are the railroad ties. And I watched further on in the direction I thought it was going. So essentially she knows it's her sister likely who is swimming, but she can't see her sister clearly. Her sister is sort of dismembered and there's sort of arms and legs, but there's no cohesive whole. So then the grandmother says it's important, you know, that you've come back because it's important for any young bride to spend time with her mother. And Cassandra responds by saying, what mother? I said, I saw the leg again or the arm leg, I think. So there's this sense of, of this dismemberment that's happening to her sister because visually she can't see um, in these, she, you know, she's, she's looking through these railroad ties at the pool, but it's tied into this, this fact of this mother who is also gone, who is also absent. So there's this tying together of even the mother into this notion of the water. So um, fairly soon we have these two descriptions that I love. As someone who has grown up in California and grown up in the drought, you never make water work. So, you know, you have to scrub your dishes with the scrub brush and not let water, you know, sort of do the work for you. And you also never would play with water. So twice her father catches her playing with water. And this is something that, you know, her father would say, don't play with water. Um, so, so there is a sense of water as being um, something that is attractive to Cassandra. She keeps wanting to play with it. And, and we can read into this notion of water as sort of process. She's wanting to approach it and she's wanting to immerse herself and she's wanting to experience this cleansing, but she also um, is being told not to play with it. So and one of the things too is when he says don't play with the water, there is a sense of playing with fire, of course. Um, and when she has her hair, at one point, her father um, says she looks like a dryad. This notion of her hair having gone through all of the, the when she falls in the dust off of the ladder, that her hair has gone through the wind because of the um, open convertible car, and then it's gone through the water, and then it's gone through the earth because of the dust in it, everything but fire. Um, but when we look at um, the playing with water, on page 37, she says, I took an ice cube out of the bucket, closed my fist over it and let it drip into the copper sink. This comes under the head of playing in the water, but Papa didn't apparently notice. And it had the effect of rallying my forces and not letting me give up. Then on the second page or the next page, I felt my hand tighten on the ice cube. A bit further down, I dropped the ice cube into the copper basin and it lay there in the drain looking so useless that I turned on the water to help it melt and get it over with. So there's this sense of Cassandra as, as identifying with this ice cube and having a real sense of fortitude in, in holding it. Um, and of course, 
ice is water that is frozen that is not that is not passing away that is not processing it's resisting um well I mean, it is, it's melting, but it's, it's resisting the flow, which is kind of water's most natural, um, most natural state. So we have this overriding motif of water, of swimming in the water, of, um, you know, this sort of baptismal water, of all of these different elements of water. And in this case, she is playing both with flowing water and with ice. Again, um, just after this point, or just before this point, her father describes her as a dryad. So she says something, he says something about her hair looking like a dryad's hair. And importantly, a dryad is a, it's a nymph, which is a, you know, a, one of the lesser gods in the Greek kind of pantheon. And, but it is, um, the dryads are, are associated with trees and, and they're nymphs who are sort of nubile, marriageable, sexually kind of potent uh, lesser goddesses, but naiads are the ones who are in the water and dryads are the one who are in the trees, who sort of inhabit trees. So there's this idea of, of, of water and of, of earth as being two sort of um, strata in which, these, um, in which they live and her father is sort of claiming her as a dryad. So then on page 37 and, oops, I read that, 37 and 38, Oh, and then we have that hilarious, speaking of water and not water and not processing, we have that hilarious moment where um, Judith is on the phone with Jack Finch, Lynch, Lynch, no, Finch. Oh my gosh. So my confusion, of course, stems from the fact that Cassandra is often calling him Lynch and then realizes that it's Finch. Both of those names being very significant, of course, because a lynching, you know, a lynching is a, is a strangulation of someone. So she's imagining his name is Lynch when in fact it's Finch. Finch being kind of close to Fink, um, Finch being close to Flinch. So there are all sorts of connotations that are coming up with poor Jack's name. But when Jack is on the telephone, where does our Cassandra find herself? But in her grandmother's shower, fully dressed, there is no water. She's standing in a bathtub with a shower curtain around her. So there are two different sources of water. Um, and of course, she's fully dressed and not going to, you know, have, have any of that processing happening. None of the flowing of the water, none of the cleansing or changing of the water is going to affect her. When Judith comes to find her, though, she is feigning that she needs to be washing her, her face. And when Judith asks her a question, she makes it sound gurgly through the water. So there is, there's just a sort of omnipresence of, of water throughout. Also, this is the kind of detail that just absolutely blows my mind. So um, she realizes that her bikini, Cassandra's bikini, is in a drawer back in Berkeley. But... Her bikini, interestingly, is black and brown striped, which sounds kind of hideous to me, but, you know, different era. But the important thing about that and the impressive detail that we have layered in here is this is, is the fact that also Jack uh, Finch, when Judith meets him at the airport, is wearing a suit that is black and brown striped. So you see this kind of toggling of Judith between her sister who's wearing this black and brown striped bikini and her, uh, her fiance who is wearing also a black and brown suit. Um, incredible details, incredible parallels that, you know, even if you're not noticing them somewhere in your subconscious, this is subconscious, this is why, um, you know, I think the, the prose feels so rich and why this book really rewards reading and reading again. And it's just, it's an incredible use of symbolism. So now we're gonna move uh, to page 71. Take a quick look at what's happening there with the water. Oh, okay, this is amazing. This is the scene when, um, when Cassandra does go swimming. So she's in the middle here and there's been a lot of anticipation about her uh, taking her sister's place in the water. I felt the bottoms of my feet push against the coping and then the quick breath and the lift and the deep thrust and no thoughts now, just water, my element. Water doesn't change. It remains my element. And then a little further down, when I came to the light, so she sees this light that's kind of like the moon in the swimming pool. When I came to the light, I touched it with both hands, claimed it for Olympus, my country, and then came up and broke the surface and hung at the edge of the coping, grasping for breath, the way we used to at the end of a race. 
it's so incredible. So first of all, this coping, you know, the coping is just the, the sort of um, the concrete edge that you would have around a pool, but this idea of grasping the coping, of her coping, this idea of kind of barely coping. And, and we're also getting a sense here of the fact, and there have been um, little indications of this all along, but Cassandra is not well. She's stopped eating. She's essentially stopped feeding herself in the nine significant nine months that Judith has been gone. It's sort of an effort to, um, you know, to make herself smaller and to make herself ultimately disappear, this idea of not, not you know, nurturing herself. But so here we have her in this kind of rarefied in her element, and she's claiming this as a naiad and as a dryad and for all of the gods on Olympus. So there is this sense of potency that we have when she is in her element. And then when she comes back up and she's just barely coping, she's grasping onto this coping. So then a little further down on that same page, her sister Judith is nearby and says, I thought you weren't ever going to come up, she said. And I told her it was a sort of last minute decision, but she didn't understand it because it was all gasps. So one of the things that's also happening, um, not so much to do with water, although here we see an example of it, is communication in this book is constantly stymied. Um, and, and we're gonna talk in one minute about uh, one of the main symbolisms that, that has to do with uh, communication. But we're gonna wrap up this, this discussion of uh, the water and symbolism in the water on page 134. So now we're pretty significantly through, through the book. And we have her, this is right before Cassandra is about to make her suicide attempt or her like ish attempt. Um, right in the middle of the page here, I let the water run out of the tub and later got out myself and dried off a little and caught a look at myself in the long mirror on the door. Lots of mirrors throughout the entire novel as well. Thin, but I didn't think really too thin. Somewhat boyish, but again, not all the way. The dryad word came again. My dear papa, the great skeptic, and which skeptic was it that said that the only thing better than dying young is never to have been born at all? So this idea of a dryad is connected with her father, who is really, you know, this, well, she herself at one point calls herself like an existentialist, um, Marxist, she talks about having a Buddhist friend and Buddhism, of course, is all about letting go of attachment. So there, there's this real sense of nihilism that's coming from her father. And this word dryad is sort of associated with him in this pronouncement that, that she is, is um, you know, more associated with the wood and the land and not with the water. So then, of course, um, on the next page, when she's talking about well, when she's walking us through what is essentially a suicide attempt. So um, in, in this page, though, we have this idea, she has a glass of water that she's bringing in. And so water is the tool with which she's going to ingest the poison. So here water is becoming something more nefarious. Here it's, it's her element, but it's the element which will deliver her unto death really is what is happening here. And in fact, she almost runs out of the water, but is able to sort of pace it and um, succeeds in, in having just the right amount of water. So. I want to close by this discussion uh, by looking at page 226, which is the last page in the book, um, the, well, the last page of the novel. Just we're not going to look at it too closely because at the end of today is when we're going to take a much closer look at the close of the novel. But what I want you all to notice is that water is the last word of the entire book. So we've talked before about how words that end a sentence or a paragraph or a chapter are words that have extra weight put on them. Well, as you might imagine, the word that the book ends on takes on very, very significant weight. And in this case, it's so beautiful because what she's talking about now is the water of the bay. She's talking about the ocean and she's talking about looking down upon it from the Golden Gate Bridge. So at this point, she has she has decided, at least for now, not to jump off of that bridge. And it's the sock that is falling um, and she doesn't quite see it hit the water. Uh, but, but there is this sense of, of water in the end as both being, you know, a sign of optimism in that she is deciding to keep going to keep living but there is also a sense of water as being um you know the way that she would have 
truly, you know, throughout the entire book, she's she's discussed she's <laughs> discussing with us with her trusty reader um, whether or not she is going to take this exit sign and jump off the bridge and presumably drown. So. One of the things that's happening throughout is we have water has all of these different meanings, all of these different associations, all of these different valences. But it's really fascinating that one of them is is either sort of deliverance, you know, it's either sort of this baptism and growth in the Central Valley, or it is in fact drowning and death. So just to give you a sense of like the incredible skill with which uh, Dorothy Baker wields her her pen in terms of symbolism, we could have done this same 20 minute interlude with shoes. So, you know, she has her sneakers that her sister says, you, are you trying to look like a prophet because they're falling apart? And she uses the lace to, to um, tie up her bathing suit. So you have her sneakers, you have the wedding shoes, we have her being barefoot at different times. We have the espadrilles. Um, so you could, we could do easily 90 minutes probably on the shoes. We could do um, a long, long uh, look at the moths. How about moths flying to the flame, to the light, um, the moths that are a symbol of summer that are associated with the grandmother who sees them as destructive, um, but also Cassandra who sees them as beautiful. Clothing in general is so important throughout the entire book. It's really a main motif and it's, um, you know, you could do just with the wedding dresses, for example, which is a giant symbol, the clutch bag, the fact that she has this bag, it's both clutch in the sense that it comes through in a clutch, but it's also a clutch bag. In fact, at one point she is clutching it like a, like a baby, like a doll. Um, and, and, and part of that is because it is a cry for help. It's when she's taking all of those pills um, and not quite wanting to kill herself, there is a sense I like to read into it that she wants this um, this surrogate mother, this analyst, to come to her and, and help her. She wants someone to come and, and sort of rescue her and save her. So it's this idea of, of being a child. So it's associating the baby with herself. She herself is the baby. She's clutching this purse to her, um, to her chest. But also this idea of, of needing to go through this kind of dark soul of the night um, and, and becoming more of a mother figure herself. Telephones are an incredibly important symbol throughout. So it's it's talking about distance and long distance communication and the inability to communicate and interruptions and the costliness, you know, the the, the sort of the cost that, that it takes from one, not only just the coins, but the ability to communicate. And then we have the clown. So we have this this kind of clown that is is given to them by their mother and they don't feel like they can take the clown down and the clown emerges at these very important times in the text. But it's important to remember that, you know, you can have a sad clown, you can have a happy clown and clouds are dumb in the sense that they are mute. Um, at one point, uh, Judith says something to Cassandra about being dumb and Cassandra says, you know, Papa taught us long ago that, that dumb means mute. So there is this sense of, of a clown as not being able to communicate. You could read that the mother's inability to be there and to, to sort of watch over them is this sort of clown-like, uh, you know, the, the, the mother, that the clown is a stand-in for the mother. In fact, there are times when um, Judith seems to think that the best thing that the mother did uh, was entertain them. So there's this idea of the clown as a real stand in for the mother. And, um, you know, she seemed the mother, Jane, seemed like someone who was, um, you know, vivacious and who was independent and devoted to her husband and very positive and entertaining in lots of ways. And yet um, also someone who, according to that very first line by, by Cassandra, someone who um, maybe wasn't that wild about having a long life, which, you know, makes us wonder about depression. Point about the symbolism in the, listing all of these other elements is we could talk forever about all of the different symbols in the book. Um, it, you know, these tiny, tiny details that are symbolic in and of themselves, and then these motifs and a motif is simply um, a, a symbol or a, a metaphor that, that continues throughout the whole book, like the water. So water is seen as a symbol, but it's also seen as a motif that runs through the entire book. So this is just one of the very, very many ways that Dorothy uh, Baker is really proving her chops as just an amazing prose artist. So in terms of structure, we have this experience that she has with Vera and this notion that um, that work and interest and love are the keys to, to wanting to live and to living a full life. 
And what I really love is that there's kind of a little coda at the very end. There's like a little uh, thing that brings us full circle. So the last, what is it? The last four pages of the novel show us Cassandra back at Berkeley. And I was so happy to see her back there. And not only is she full circle in being back in Berkeley and back in their apartment, but we have this woman, Liz Jenko. So Liz Jenko is one who is calling uh, in the very beginning of the novel on page six. And it, it's her, it, she is Liz Jenko, someone who had been calling on the telephone, Cassandra tells us, for two months. So this is someone who, you know, she is currently having some sort of love involvement with. Um, and it's, it's important to remember that the, the span of the wedding is a week or two, exactly what Cassandra tells us at the beginning. So she's been seeing Liz Jenko for a couple of months. She's gone for a week or two, and now she's back in Berkeley. Here's Liz Jenko looking in the window. So what I love here is what we are seeing is uh, the, this exactly the dedication to work, which we know she's going to go back to, to interests, which are borne out in lots of different ways. Um, just when we take a close look at the end of the novel, we'll be able to see the, these kind of her interests coming to the fore in terms of writing and in terms of beauty and in terms of noticing the world around her and also love. So we have this kind of idea, in fact, that she is um, that that she that things are going to resume with Liz Jenko. Not that there's going to be any sort of long term thing or marriage necessarily, but there is this sense of of love. So the close of the novel I find so beautiful. It's I, I mentioned how structurally we're coming full circle. She's back in Berkeley. Uh, and she's she runs into Liz Jenko. What's nice is Liz Jenko um, has just come from walking across the Golden Gate Bridge, which is obviously very significant. Bridges are a major uh, symbol throughout the novel. We have the Golden Gate, of course, as, as this kind of existential exit sign um, that, that's very alluring for Cassandra because she's contemplating suicide. But the idea of a bridge is also very important because bridges are constantly being built or, or sort of blown up between and among people throughout the entire novel. So it, bridges are very important. And it turns out that Liz Jenko has been wanting to do this for a long time and has just done uh, you know, this, this walk across the bridge from San Francisco to Sausalito and back. And I love the fact that Dorothy Baker does not have the two of these young women go out together and do this together, which would have been an easy thing to do and it would have been sort of the rom-com thing to do. But in fact, Liz Jenko's like, oh no, sorry, I wish you'd, I wish you'd called me earlier because I, I went and did this thing this morning. And what's beautiful then is we have Cassandra going and doing it herself, which, you know, it, it's, it's very significant too that she's able to go to this bridge, which has been the site of these suicidal fantasies of hers for a long time. We're going to look at this very last portion of the book on 224. This is um, Liz Jenko, she, who is a painter. And uh, so... This is uh, Cassandra telling us about Liz. She turned away from the window and leaned back against it and said, the only thing I think about these days is light and what it does to things. Light on water is something to consider. It's so beautiful. So of course we have lightness, which means hope. Um, it's significant that when Cassandra arrived at the ranch, it was dark. She was arriving in darkness and she went through sort of this dark night of the soul. Well, the next day she did, but this, it was, it was a time of a lot of darkness um, contrasted by a lot of light when she was at the ranch. And here we have this young woman who's saying, the thing I'm thinking about now is light. It's just so beautiful. And not only is it light, but light on water. So water, we discussed during our chunk on symbolism, water is a huge um, element. And it is, in fact, Cassandra says, it is my element. So this idea of light playing on water is very, very different than the idea of, of you know, submerging yourself in water. And importantly, when Cassandra does swim at the ranch, she goes and she claims the light. It feels like a bit of a moon, but she claims it, you know, for Olympus. So there is this idea of light in water um, th th that is already established in the center of the book, and then we're returning to it here. Then we have this unbelievable passage about art and about the importance of art and sort of saving our lives with art. So this is page 225 here. That's painters. But for me, it was pretty much the same thing. I could never write any of this until I could tear up the pawn ticket on the ghost of my mother. It's a different order of hawking, but it comes to the same thing. Don't lean, stand up, find a way. I kept on thinking about it though, what she said about what light does to things. 
what light does to water, or possibly what water makes light do to it. Who does what to whom? And I ended up walking across the bridge myself. It's so beautiful. So she's turning it a bit upside down, this idea of maybe what, what it is that water does to light. So this idea of having, having to have gone through this difficulty, this sort of baptism that we saw you know, from the pump house and then this bathing and the light in the water. So all of this has been you know, these struggles and all of this sort of temptation of drowning um, it has been very much about moving through something in order to, to move toward lightness, not moving toward the light, you know, but in, in, the, in the death sense, but, but moving toward lightness. And then we have this gorgeous, um, highly symbolic final paragraph down at the bottom of 225. I was wearing loafers and socks, and on the way back, I was walking faster, and one of my socks kept crawling down behind my heel. So I love this loafers. Shoes are a really big symbol throughout the novel. She's wearing loafers. She's comfortable. She's comfortable in her own shoes. I also like the, the detail that she's walking faster. It's like she's kind of overcome this thing. And I also see her, this idea of walking faster is, um, it, it, you know, it's an eagerness and an urgency. And whether she's going back to her thesis or going back to Liz Jenko or going back to contemplate light, um, all of that is, is, you know, you can interpret that however you want. She's going back to all of those things, presumably. But the fact that she's walking faster, to me, is, is speaking to a real optimism that she's feeling. Uh, one of my socks kept crawling down behind my heel. I stopped and pulled it up two or three times, and finally I slipped the shoe off and dropped the sock over the side and stood where I was and watched it go. So earlier, I couldn't figure out about the sock. I don't know if it has to do with being socked, you know? I don't know if it has to do with um, knitting things together. I don't know if it has to do with comfort um, or, or being a young girl. Loafers and socks to me seems like something a young girl would wear. But I also, um, in this idea of then being uneven, of only having the one sock on, is very reminiscent of when she puts on, when she has only the one wedding shoe on, and, and the sort of idea of being imbalanced and of having two things that, that should be a pair, and yet now they are, are, they are single. So there's lots of symbol in this, in this sock, this idea, I think, you know, all of those things are probably, all of them are, 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 you know, decent ways to read this. I have a feeling that the idea of a pair in this case, because she only put on the one wedding shoe and here she is throwing away one of the socks. Um, it, there's a sense of, of not needing to have both anymore, not needing to be one of a pair. I slipped the shoe off and dropped the sock over the side and stood where I was and watched it go, or tried to. It took immense concentration to stay with it. When I thought I'd lost it for good, the wind caught it far down and I saw it flash in the sunlight once and again and maybe a third time. Again, here we have this beautiful light. We have what light can do to things. But after that, I don't know. It was out of sight a long time before it could have hit the water. It's so beautiful. It's such a, the, every single word is so well chosen. And this idea of ending the book with the word water is so beautiful. So I, I'm so happy to read a book that has so much pathos and so much complexity, but one that's also so appealing and frankly, one that ends on a very positive note. So I hope that you've gotten a lot out of these sessions about Cassandra at the wedding. And I hope that you've enjoyed your introduction to Dorothy Baker, who I think maybe has written um, one of the strongest novels I have ever read. Readers, thank you so much for tuning in today. The lectures really are the lifeblood of the Fox page, but you should really go to thefoxpage.com. There are five minute recommendations where I will predict in about five minutes whether you should or should not tackle Ulysses, or maybe why you shouldn't be so snobby about the recent uh, Leanne Moriarty beach read. There are also talks, no rereading required, on old favorites like Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, or Frog and Toad, which is quite frankly a literary masterpiece. There's also this very cool thing where you answer a couple of questions and this cool wheel spins around and spits out a recommendation that I think might be exactly what you need and it might be something that stretches you a little bit. Come and check out thefoxpage.com. Thanks for listening and mostly happy reading.